When working with wood, it often happens that you need to mark at a constant distance from an edge. Because it's almost impossible to do this by hand, there are various tools available. The classic woodworking tool for this purpose is the marking gouge. It has a scale and a needle with which you can scratch the wood at an adjustable distance. Many marking gouges come with two scales, which is often practical when you have to jump back and forth between two measures. For example, when marking tenon joints. If you like, you can trace the sketch with a pencil after marking, so that you will see it better. This is a more modern version of the marking gouge. Instead of using a needle, it comes with a circular blade that doesn't tear the wood fibers, but cut them. This makes the scratch finer and more precise. With a micro-adjustment, the distance can be chosen very precisely. Since the circular blade defines the end of the marking gouge, it can be used for direct reference measurements without having to rely on units. For example, a board thickness can be quickly and easily transferred to an edge. This is often necessary when producing classic wood joints, where very precise markings are required for a backlash-free joint. Quick tip, if you don't have a marking gouge, a caliper can offer a comparable function. A caliper usually has a shoulder on its back for step measurements. Once you have adjusted and fixed your measurements, you can take it as a stop and drive down the edge quite precisely. The construction side variant of this method would be the folding ruler, which is simply held firmly in the hand. Alternatively, you can take an angle which sits better at the edge, but the pencil has no stop to sit on. Therefore, there are these angles with holes, so you can keep the distance without any problems. The logical further development of this is this stop angle. With it, the holes are no longer just every centimeter, but every millimeter, so you can mark at any distance between 1 and 55 millimeters to the edge quickly. Personally, I find this principle ingenious and like to use this angle when it has to be fast and doesn't depend on the tenth of a millimeter. However, the angle is unfortunately not as precise as it could be. The holes themselves have a diameter of around about 2 mm, which makes it impossible to scribe to the millimeter. The fact that there is a more precise way to do this is proven by these rulers, which allow working to a quarter of a millimeter with their whole pattern. However, these are rulers that cannot be used optimally on three-dimensional objects. They are intended more for technical drawings on paper. But I want to combine the best of these rulers and the marking angle. That's why I bought these aluminum angles. Once in blank and once anodized. First I cut a handy piece of the angle. Then I colored the surface to be able to scratch markings on it. I marked the thickness on the angle on its surface and made a grid from there. I was skeptical from the very start whether the whole thing could be done by hand. And by the time I prepared the holes it was obvious that I could neglect this method.
When I had to find out that the chuck of my drilling machine could not hold one millimeter drills, it was clear to me that I need to have a more precise tools. I spent 150 bucks to solve a $15 problem. So what do we have here? This is a holder for my Dremel. You can lock the Dremel tool in it and then move it up and down with this lever, just like with a bench drill. But you can also turn the holder and bring the work pieces up to the Dremel. The drill chuck is fine enough to hold 0.5mm drills in place. This drill has a diameter of 0.8mm. And this is a XY table, or a coordinate table. It has T-slots which can be used to clamp work pieces on it. The table can then be moved with two cranks in the X and Y axis. This is accurate to the 20th of a millimeter. One full revolution corresponds to one millimeter. To fix the cross table to the Dremel holder, I drilled a few threads in it and then screwed it on. So, attempt number two. If such an angle rests on an edge, then between the outer edge of the angle and the edge of the workpiece there is of course still the thickness of the angle. But since I define the edge of the workpiece as the zero line, I have to subtract the wall thickness of the angle again. That's what I did at the first try. Then I place the whole thing so that it really rests on the zero line. The cranks are set to zero and then I start. I make the first hole at one millimeter. Then go forward in steps of 0.5 millimeters. To the left I proceed one millimeter with each hole. After the first holes are made, it was already clear that the drill had to be pushed further into the drill chuck. Otherwise it would wander a bit and lose precision. It was obvious that the angle would not be a success, so I wanted to test something else and see if I could grind a few marks into the angle with a small cutting disc, which also failed. And the first check also shows the angle is not true to dimensions, deviates by about 1 mm. Fine markings are best made on aluminum with a fine cutter knife.
Attempt number three. The drill sits deeper in the drill chuck and I change the distance between the holes. Instead of 1mm in the width, it's now 2mm, so it should be easier to handle. But also this time I have deviations of 0.5mm, not good enough. Attempt number 4. This time I do not place the drill in the line that marks the wall thickness, but take a different approach. I drive the drill to the outer wall of the angle and then drive it in about the wall thickness. Then half the drill diameter, which is 0.4mm, and then I am exactly on the edge. Then drive it in another millimeter and then proceed as before. I also doubled the distance between the holes again from 2 to 4 mm in order to equalize the hole even more. And success! The made markings fit exactly this time. Now I want to improve the angle a bit and apply numbers. I read that you could bluish aluminum with quick burnish. I thought maybe I could apply numbers with a template. I didn't think that it would work because you can't burnish aluminum normally, but I tried it anyway. As expected, the whole thing didn't work. The aluminum didn't oxidize. It wasn't about the burnishing substance that's proven with this nut, which immediately turns black. So, plan B, acetonate. For acetonate transfer, printing ink is detached by acetone from a carrier material, usually paper, and transferred to a target material, in this case, aluminum. I didn't know how well this would work with aluminum and whether it would work at all, and so I tested it first. And it works. I prepared the ankle, marked the center line and cleaned everything. I centered the edge to exactly 90 degrees so you could use it as a normal angle. Then I created a PDF and printed it. It is important to print the whole thing inverted because it will be detached and reapplied the wrong way around. And to use the laser printer. At least I had no success with an inkjet printer. Using the correct amount of acetone is the difficulty in this process. If you take too little, the ink doesn't come off completely, and if you take too much, you also beat it off the target material. So far, I've only used this technique on cardboard and wood. Both materials absorb the acetone. Accordingly, you need a lot of it there. As I have noticed, this is not helpful with aluminum, because you quickly smear and dissolve the whole thing instead of having a clear transfer. 
In a second attempt, it went way better with just a few depths of acetone. <laughs> 